Okay, so building on where we just finished off on Friday here, that we have again kind of the framework here of, of utilitarianism. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of presented you with a couple of examples that, that you know make you kind of hopefully think about utilitarianism, but also like, and not even think of it in a negative way, but also it's a very plausible theory, right? And, th and this is what we see. And this is why we see utilitarianism continually being implemented uh, in social political discourse. Excuse me, social and political discourse. Okay. Now, utilitarianism as an ethical theory uh, is one of the most influential moral theories in history. The English philosopher Jeremy Bentham was the first to kind of fill out the theory in detail, but the English philosopher and econo uh, economist John Stuart Mill developed it further. Okay. In their hands, utilitarianism became a powerful instrument of social reform. It provided a rationale for promoting women's rights, improving the treatment of prisoners, advocating for animals' rights, and aiding the poor. All radical ideas in Bentham and Mill's day. In the 21st century, the theory still has a strong effect on moral and policy decision-making in many areas, including health care, criminal justice, and government. Okay? So again, this theory is, is not... It's not gone away. It's not been kind of, uh, you know, it's not, it's not dead at all by any means, right? It's still very alive and well. And many, many people make decisions on a utilitarian kind of calculus. Now, at the heart of utilitarianism is what's called the greatest happiness principle, or kind of like, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how Mill describes it, is the greatest happiness principle. And it goes back to Wednesday's discussion on the fact that the, that you know, there's a focus on pain and pleasure in relationship to the consequences of actions as it relates to do those actions produce pain or pleasure? More pain, less pleasure, more pain than pleasure, right? That we need to reevaluate. So this is the greatest happiness principle. The creed which accepts as the, foundations of, uh, the, fa as the foundation of morals utility or the greatest happiness principles. Let me just start again. I'm going to read it a little slow. The creed which accepts as the foundation of morals utility or the greatest happiness principle holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is intended pleasure in the absence of pain and by unhappiness pain in the privation of pleasure. So again, fairly straightforward. I'm just going to read it again. The greatest happiness principle states actions are right as they tend to promote pleasure. Actions are wrong as they tend to promote pain. Okay? So that is as simple kind of as an ethical framework, an ethical decree that we have kind of met yet in this class. Okay? And so now we take it to a next step. Okay? Because in philosophy, there's always kind of a next step. Now, Mill wants to distinguish here between kind of what he's going to term the quantity and quality of pleasures. Okay? And fairly kind of easy to understand. When you have like a qualitative analysis of a utilitarian uh, question, you measure it, right? And so in class, typically what I often do is I, I give an example of saying, all right, we're going to go have a philosophical field trip. We're going to go do something exotic, like go to Coeur d'Alene, because Coeur d'Alene is exotic. And I, and I say, all right, I'll be providing lunch for everyone. And there are 60 students in the class, and I say, all right, you have two options. And I'm not including dietary restrictions for this thought example. Okay? You can either choose to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a tuna salad sandwich. Okay, those are your two choices for lunch. Okay, I take a poll, as simple as that. Okay, and out of the 60 students, 47 raise their hands in favor of the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 13 of them raise their hand for the tuna fish salad sandwich. If I'm a utilitarian, I make notice of that and I say, well, 47 people will experience pleasure 13 will experience pain. We're having peanut butter and jelly. As simple as that, as we think about 
quantity of pleasures. Okay? Easy as that. Okay? I mean, we see this represented again on, you know, we have various elections coming up. You'll see the popular vote. I mean, I know that with the presidential election, the electoral college gets kind of complicated in it. But generally speaking, right, when we vote, right, the will of the majority, right, we hear that phrase, the will of the majority is that which decides kind of what candidate will represent them at whatever kind of political office that candidate is vying for. Right? Because arguably, even if like the vote is like 51% vote for, for candidate A and 49% vote for candidate B, candidate A wins and from a utilitarian measurement is going to kind of give more people more pleasure even when that margin is so small. Okay? So this is what we think about the quantity of pleasure. Okay? That, that, that even though there still might be some... some Minority that, that is um, affected here, right? My 13 students that wanted tuna salad sandwiches, tuna fish salad sandwiches. It's tuna fish, that's kind of like a redundant phrase, right? Because tuna is a fish, so you don't really need to say fish, okay? But those that wanted tuna salads, tuna salad sandwiches, do I just say, well, suck it up, you're getting peanut butter and jelly, or should I like listen to their voice, right? So what about the minority, okay, when it comes to the quantity of pleasures? And that kind of coincides with the question, well, what about those that are going to be experiencing pain? Okay. So that's what we're seeing here. And when we think about the quantity of pleasure, is from a utilitarian framework, we can ask the question of, are more people going to experience pleasure or pain? More people are going to experience pleasure? Great. Okay. There are still issues with that framework for the fact that we have to ask questions about the minority. We have to ask questions about those that do experience pain, right? But still, you know, pretty easy. Now, when we think about the quality of pleasure, it gets a little more difficult, okay? And this is where Mill has a real hold on utilitarianism, is that Mill wanted to focus uh, very much so on the quality of pleasures, okay? And, and in that, we think about those types of pleasures that are longer lasting. And this goes back again all the way to hedonism that we discussed on Wednesday of the fact that, you know, hedonism, we have these kind of like, you know, you, you would say like animalistic pleasures, right? Eating, drinking, having sex. That, yes, those kind of experiences and others like them can be really enjoyable. They can be really um, uh, pleasurable, but ultimately, right, they're not long lasting. And so Mill does want to draw our attention to the fact that certain pleasures should be kind of prioritized and, and, um, and, and can be quality, qualitatively more enjoyable. Okay? And so we see this here in, this, in the following. Uh, da, 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 da. Mill contends that happiness can vary in quantity and quality. There are lower pleasures, such as eating, drinking, and having sex, and there are higher pleasures, such as pursuing knowledge, appreciating beauty, and creating art. The higher pleasures, Mill contends, are superior to the lower ones. The lower ones can be intense and enjoyable, but the higher ones are qualitatively better and more fulfilling. In this scheme, a person enjoying a mere taste of a higher pleasure may be closer to the moral ideal than the hedonistic glutton who gorges on the lower pleasures. Thus Mill declared, and this is a pretty famous quote in, in philosophy, thus Mill declared it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. Okay? And so here, what we have is the fact that, again, um, when we think about kind of like, unlike the, uh, when we think about like democracy or when we think about kind of like, you know, social change, the fact that, that you know, if there, if there is a law or a policy put forth that in fact kind of can bring more people up and give more people pleasure, then that should be the policy of the law that's preferable. Additionally, like, and, and, and when we think about like, 
education reform. Maybe that's a good example here, right? When we think about education reform, okay, the fact that, yes, right, like sometimes like learning is rigorous and it's going to cause pain and, you know, sometimes when you're doing like hard philosophy or you're doing hard, um, you know, architecture homework or something and you really just want to have like a beer or you really just want to go eat a, eat a hamburger, right, something like that. Because like eating or drinking and, and you know, that's going to bring you those kind of like momentary pleasures. But the fact, Mill is recognizing that as it relates to education reform and as it relates to the promotion of education, right, that will be more long lasting than eating that hamburger. Okay? And so Mill wants to focus on both the quantity and the quality of pleasures. Okay? And so this is where we're again... Uh, yeah, and so this is where, again, we get that quote that it's better to be uh, a human dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. For the fact that it takes more to make a human happy because we have the intellect and we have the ability to be happier, okay? to, to experience more pleasure. And again, it might be the case that, that you know, ex exhibiting and experiencing, um, exhibiting and experiencing, you know, artistic expression or exhibiting and experiencing music or exhibiting and, expri uh, and, and uh, exhibiting and, and experiencing, you know, those kind of higher cerebral things are more pleasurable than eating a hamburger. Now, on some days, right, hamburger tastes pretty damn good if you're a meat eater. But that pleasure isn't as long-lasting as the development of rationale, the development of kind of creativity in Mill's perspective. In the next video, not now that we've just kind of dichotomized that Mill is, is in favor of thinking about both quantity and quality of pleasures, in the next video we're going to break down uh, fairly briefly, um, fairly briefly here, uh, the focus on, on um, what's called act utilitarianism and rule utilitarianism. And then I'm going to provide just a couple of counterexamples of utili to utilitarianism because I think that they're entertaining and they they and you you have no shortage of them. So to the next video.